So welcome everyone, bienvenue to Paris, a city of ideas with Roger Mummert. AFUSA is the largest Alliance Française network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French each year to, as you all know now, learn French, live French, and love everything French with the Alliance Française. We've got a few national events coming up soon. Um, since we're starting late, I'm not going to go through them all, but but we have Adrian Leeds, Art Nouveau, Chef Alain Le Notre again, Secrets of Mastering French, which is hugely popular, and many other events. So please continue to look at www.afusa.org for all of our great cultural events. Again, a couple of logistics. Please stay on mute during the presentation. Stay on speaker view. All of the questions will be answered from the chat. And if for any reason you have technical issues today, sign back in after a couple of minutes using the original Zoom link. The event is being recorded for our YouTube channel, which will be available in the next couple of days. And the total runtime is one hour. So we're absolutely thrilled today to welcome Roger Mummert. Roger is a writer and photographer whose writing on cultural and travel has been published in the New York Times and elsewhere. Creator of the ParisProject.net, an experiential resource for appreciating Paris as a city of ideas. So welcome, Roger. We're thrilled to have you with us, and we're looking so forward to hearing more about Paris. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, to the Alliance Francaise for making this program possible and for allowing me to share some of my love for Paris, its history and its culture. Um, like so many writers and artists, I spent time in Paris as a young a student and uh, walking the boulevards. I, I took classes each morning at Alliance Francaise and Boulevard Raspail. And uh, the city really has never left me in many, many years. I created Paris, a city of ideas and the parisproject.net, the website to explore and try to define why Paris has been such a fertile place for the imagination for so long. And also to think a bit differently about how we travel, maybe a little bit less about going down the bucket list of things we have to do and more about uh, the search for meaning and exploring the nature of creativity as we uh, visit cultures outside of our own. So let's take a trip to Paris, a city of ideas. Two iconic structures sit in opposition across the landscape of Paris. One is made of iron. It soars upward, pierces the sky. It celebrates science, technology, and modernity, the Eiffel Tower on the Champ de Mars. The other is made of stone. It sits commandingly above the city, a beacon to the faithful, the Sacre Coeur Basilica on the Butte de Montmartre. Visitors to Paris see these monuments largely in aesthetic terms. They admire their graceful majesty. They take selfies to post on social media. First time in Paris, you really have to do the program. Put yourself in the Instagram moment or in terms now antiquated, step into the postcard. But if we look closely, we see a text. Virtually everything about these two structures is steeped in ideology. Both the Eiffel Tower and the Sacre Coeur were conceived with ideological agendas. One to showcase Paris as the pinnacle of science and imagination. The other to call Parisians back to faith or even to reinstall the monarchy as due penance for moral decay. Both structures stand on historic sites, sacred ground if you embrace the myths that surround and empowerment, empower them. One myth glorifies the revolution and the enlightenment. The other embodies the allegory of Saint-Denis, the first bishop of Paris who miraculously had the final word over the Roman pagans who beheaded him. Both sites saw massacres and claimed their martyrs. Both structures, when they were built, were vilified as hideous affronts to the graceful cityscape. One, a monstrous smokestack, the other, a Turkish folly. But both have become iconic expressions of Paris, their images recognizable the world over. These two monuments were constructed in an era when France was swirling in a vortex of ideas, political, cultural, philosophical. The country was struggling to define itself as a modern state in a changing world, and Paris was the gaslit stage for it all. The ideas embodied by these monuments of the 19th century largely had been defined in the 18th century and had origins even earlier. And they still are passionately debated today in Paris, a city of ideas. Let's explore a basic question. What makes a city? 
meaning what materials comprise it? How do people and culture animate it? How does it evolve over time? What forces prevail and why as an aged city transitions into a modern one? And specifically, what makes the city of Paris one of the great centers of the world for centuries, even millennia, so fascinating in so many ways? Paris, in my mind, is a city where ideas flourish and a place where you easily can slip through the cracks of time and feel the presence of thinkers of centuries past. Their ideas defy time. Generation after generation wrestles with the same core questions. Is there free will? Are we guided by a divine hand or by reason? Who are we as a society? How do we achieve equality, in class, economics, opportunity? And how do we live in a sustainable way? These questions ebb and flow in the social discourse, but never do they fully disappear. Ideas born in antiquity continue to shape urban life. And this brings us to our exploration of Paris, a city of ideas. Now, let me at the onset offer one caveat. I'm a journalist and a storyteller. I'm not a historian nor an anthropologist. I'm a linguist. I'm not a linguist, rather, <laughs> and not an archaeologist. I practice a profession that incorporates a little of all of that. A journalist is someone who is incurably curious, sticks their nose in things. A journalist researches, questions, digs deep to find out how things work. A journalist is always in search of that core idea and on discovery feels compelled to share that moment of revelation. Well, today we share a journey of discovery in the Paris of the mind and spirit, the Paris of ideas. Cities evolve in a chronology and synthesis of ideas. Ideas that coalesce into narratives, stories, allegories that in turn form a neural network of the urban landscape. Well, that's the theoretical way to put it. In practical ways, how do we see ideas as we walk through a city? Well, it's a bit like the Talmudic question, how do we know that miracles exist? The answer, miracles abound, how can we not see them? To see these ideas of Paris, let's look back to the philosoph of the Enlightenment and beyond. Voltaire in his philosophical dictionary asks, what is an idea? It's an image that paints itself on my brain. Diderot, the encyclopedist, played with ideas. The more dangerous the idea, the more he played. Sartre and de Beauvoir lived ideas, setting up shop each day at Café des Four with pen and notebook, a pack of galois, and an endless thirst for coffee and dialectic. Well, you can be a wannabe philosophe today. The cafes of Saint-Germain-des-Prés are filled with them. And when we begin to see uh, cities as ideas, in fact, layers, clusters, networks of ideas, we never stop seeing ideas. They're embedded in the text of the city. Ideas as Moliere falsified them, as Diderot and D'Alembert encyclopedied them, as Hugo romanticized them, as Baudelaire flanered them, as Baron Haussmann pierced them, and as Gustave Eiffel etched them into the sky and wrought iron, as Walter Benjamin codified them, as Gertrude Stein salonned them, as André Breton surrealized them, as Jean-Luc Godard jump cut them, and today as Mayor Anne Hidalgo from the seat of her bicycle greens them. To walk through Paris is to pass through a forest of ideas. Like trees, ideas come in sizes great and small. They shelter and inspire and they are interconnected, the roots of one nourishing those of another. The intellectual index of Paris is a section on the parisproject.net. It's a list of ideas that originated or have flourished in the city of the Enlightenment. I began it as the intellectual map of Paris, but as you can see, I had a practical problem. Too many post-it notes in the Quartier Latin, so I rebranded it an index, and the list is ever expanding. And to date, I've identified about 150 significant ideas in philosophy and religion, science and medicine, art and literature. Some ideas are foundational. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. This slogan of the revolution appears on every school and government office. Every Frenchman is constantly reminded to be a guardian of these ideals, and every political party interprets them to their own gain. These ideals are cast in stone, building facades, and embodied in myth. Marianne, the goddess of liberty, symbol of the revolution. And notably, from these three ideas come many others. We have universalism that sublimates social and ethnic differences to a common national identity. 
We have laicite or secularism that ensures religious freedom by eliminating religion and its symbols from the public realm. And we even have ultranationalism that feeds on hatred of immigrants and anti-Semitism while glorifying la France pour le Français. Some ideas are aspirational. Parnassianism. This is the basis for l'art pour l'art, or art for art's sake. Its name derives from Mount Parnassus, the home of the muses of Greek mythology. In the 19th century, it was championed by Théophile Gautier and fellow poets. Its forerunner was the romanticism of Victor Hugo, its cousin, the bohemianism of Petrus Borel, its children, the decadence of Baudelaire, the Dadaists of Sara, and on and on. Some ideas are opaque, seemingly not to be understood. We have obscurantism. Obscurantism describes a deliberate inexactness of presentation to obfuscate and to limit understanding. In the history of Paris, it's had many practitioners. In the ancien regime, the elite used it to restrict learning to their own class. The church applied it toward the destruction of unchristian texts. The enlightenment philosophes accused enemies of reason of being obscurantists. A latter-day practitioner was Jacques Lequin, who told his students, you know, the less you understand, the better you listen. And recently, President Macron used the term to denounce terrorists and Holocaust deniers, those who oppose, oppose the, spread, the spread of knowledge and reason. Now, some ideas exist within clusters of ideas. Prime example, the Paris Commune. This was a progressive utopia that lasted only 10 weeks, but it's been analyzed and debated for the past century and a half. The communards embraced Marxism, as well as a host of other ideologies in a complex ecosystem of ideas. In 1870, France was defeated in the Franco-Prussian War and Prussian troops surrounded Paris and held it captive. The assembly of the newly formed Third Republic fled to Versailles along with many wealthy bourgeois and within Paris, the people took over. The radicalized National Guard declared an independent social democracy and raised the red flag. The working class Parisians who comprised the commune included anarchists, an extreme subset being, being Blanquists, named for founder Louis-Auguste Blanqui, who planned the uprising from inside the prison. Also part of the mix, mix were feminists, a subset being anarcho-feminists. Amid this fertile mix, progressive ideas abounded. The abolition of child labor, a remission of rent, the right of workers to seize businesses abandoned by their owners, gender wage equality, and the abolition of prostitution and the closing of brothels. Further, the commonards were strongly anti-clericalist and supported a strong separation of church and state. Now, the commune ended tragically in La Semaine Saglante, or Bloody Week, a series of massacres by the Republican army that restored Republican rule over Paris. And even today, the Paris Commune arouses heated debate with its principles of class and gender equality now applied to issues like the planting of shade trees, nutrition, and public housing. Other ideas of Paris seem frivolous, absurdly, unmistakably Parisian. Here's a doozy, Lettrist International. In the early 1950s, Guy Debord founded a fun-loving group that envisioned society as a series of spectacles. They embraced a concept called derive or drift that had origins in romanticism. If this sounds dense, it is. Debord's book, The Society of the Spectacle, provides 221 declarations on society, art, economics. Each one reads like a passionate manifesto. The letters live their ideas by exploring urban society with rapid passages through varied ambiances of the city. In particular, they sought out working neighborhoods and avoided places they called irritatingly picturesque. In Paris, you have a few of those. Further, the process combines psychogeography, the study of the terrain of the city and its effects on perception with an emotional disorientation that creates situations. And that leads into another Parisianism, Situationist International. How in Paris, one ism leads to another. Okay, now a reality check. Let's pause here for a reality check. Do Parisians walk around all day thinking about ideas, about equality, about secularism, about art? This is, after all, the mystique of the flaneur blissfully wandering through the modern city, lost in thought. Or is it just history nerds like me that find issues, questions, and riddles written all over buildings, trees, and facades 
Well, here I am in my student days, retracing the bohemian life of my hero du jour, Henry Miller. That's my Alliance France card, uh, Francaise card up there. Um, some ye years later, I took my family to Paris and tried showing them a city as I knew it. They soon tired of my running cultural commentary. One of my daughters set me straight. Dad, I say I like a painting and you launch into a lecture. Oh, yes, that's a wonderful commentary on the eternal struggle for self-determination. Can't you just enjoy the painting? Uh, she's right, and I do enjoy it. But I'm also cursed with the desire to always look for that deeper text. Well, my fashionista daughters found their own deeper text at Gallery Lafayette, where we spent a glorious afternoon shopping the boutiques of cutting-edge designers. They knew the language of fashion. They saw the beauty of ideas expressed in fabric and design. They recognized the theatricality of retailing. And I was blind to that. As for how Parisians think, I can't speak for that. It's a subject for another time. Rather, this is about the ideas that Paris has bequeathed to the world, ideas we all can see and examine anew. Why Paris? Well, oh, there's the Gallery Lafayette. Why Paris? Why has Paris been such a remarkable inspiration and an incubator of ideas for so long? Paris is an old European city like so many others. Florence gave birth to the Renaissance. Amsterdam developed merchant banking. It fueled international trade. London spawned the constitutional monarchy. Why does Paris foment ideas? Les grandes idées in art and literature, science and philosophy. Why was Paris the glittering stage for the Enlightenment three centuries ago and still today draws seekers of truth and inspiration? There are many reasons, economic, cultural, aesthetic. Paris is above all a beautiful and graceful city. And not to be overlooked, Paris and France is the place to eat, drink, and sit around the table talking for hours. Which brings me to my thesis. Throughout its history, Paris has been an unsurpassed marché des idées, a marketplace of ideas. Which brings us to a battleground of ideas. This marketplace of ideas has also been a battleground of ideas. Here's a sample of foundational ideas that eternally fuel debate in French politics and Parisian life. Sovereignty. If power originates with the people, how do the people as a body politic claim it and exercise it? The theories of Montesquieu and Rousseau on this subject were written in the 18th century. It, you, yet you can hear them today in the language of Macron and Le Pen. The social contract. Do we live in a jungle or a society? And what freedoms do we sacrifice for which privileges? You could ask, is this a polemic of 18th century France or central to current American politics and nationalist movements around the world? A current issue in France in the New York Times today was that of the retirement age being raised two years and how that may violate the very notion of the social contract. The separation of church and state is a democracy a democratic society guided by the hand of God or by reason and humanist values. The concept of laïcité is foundational from the French Revolution. It guarantees religious freedom through the complete absence of religion and its symbols from the public sphere. Again, American politicians come to mind with their references to faith and religious values. In France, laïcité precludes such talk. The concept of equality. How can a society work toward ultimate egality? In the revolution, equality was largely about land, property, class. Today, equality is measured in all aspects of society, housing, education, and in nutrition and environment. Where is a shade tree planted? How can the benefits and beauty of greenery be shared equally by all neighborhoods and economic classes? What is the carbon footprint of the food on our tables? These fundamental issues are visible everywhere in the text of the city and what we see and read of contemporary society and politics in Paris, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world. Now, bear in mind, one factor we take for granted, the freedom to think and express ideas. Throughout the history of France, developing ideas, vocalizing them, writing them down and publishing them, all the traits of a philosopher or a free thinker had dangerous consequences you could face imprisonment or even death. Anything published on the Ancien Regime first had to be reviewed by an appointed censor, then granted royal privilege or approval. 
circumvent this privilege system and you could uh, suffer a stint in the Bastille. Voltaire did a, st a spell behind bars, as did Diderot, de Sade, and Linguet, who wrote a celebrated book about his incarceration. Being imprisoned had a chilling effect. Diderot, after he was sprung, wrote a great many works for the drawer, meaning to be read by posterity, literally. Some of his writings were discovered a century after his death in an armoire passed down to a descendant. Voltaire spent most of his post-prison years at a safe distance from Paris and Versailles. He had a house in Frenet on the French-Swiss border where countless philosophes gathered. Publishers also risked imprisonment, and for this reason, much of French literature was published outside France in Amsterdam or Switzerland. Books were smuggled into France by backpackers and sold by traveling colporteurs, often sous le manteau or under the cloak. During the French Revolution, expressing ideas contrary to the Committee of Public Safety could earn you a look through the Republican window, that is, through the open gates of the guillotine. One swoosh, and your thought producing head landed in a basket. And so on through Republic. Restoration of Monarchy, Empire, Commune, Republic, Republic, La Résistance, May 68, the Yellow Vests, and into the wokeism era of the Greens. The tree preservers, the urban farmers and bicycle velo activists in Paris, the expression of ideas always came at a cost. Once it was civil or criminal, now you can be shamed by faculty colleagues or shunned on social media. And yet in Paris, ideas flourished and they continue to do so. Let's look at how foundational ideas of Paris manifest in two forms, in stone and in narrative, that is, as a story, a myth, or an allegory. The idea of monarchy of the Ancien Regime. In stone, we have the massive presence of the Louvre, the statues of Louis XIV, Le Roi Soleil, and Henri IV, Le Ver Galant, on horseback. Now, the narrative, great men made a great nation, and great artists decorated it. This is the grand homme theory of history, and it's outdated and objectionable in our present era. Yet, la gloire de la France is imprinted everywhere. The idea of revolution and republic. In stone, we see this in the statues in Place de la République, Place de la Nation, top my Marianne, goddess of liberty, symbol of the revolution. The narrative, vigilance is required to maintain a classless society. The revolution had its heroes, Lafayette, its villains, Robespierre, its martyrs, Marat, slain in his bathtub. But there is no singular male hero of the revolution, no George Washington. Instead, Marianne serves as an idealized torchbearer. Recently, she was invoked into the discussion of the Burkina, the swimsuit worn by Muslim women looking to preserve modesty on the beach. Pro-nationalists objected with an absurd argument. Marianne is topless because she's a true French woman, they argued, ready to nurse the new nation of France. We have the idea of church, religion, and morality. In stone, we see this in the imposing edifices of Notre Dame, Saint Sulpice, Saint Eustache, Sacre Coeur. They are a call to faith and a commanding moral voice amid decay. The narrative of all this is included in the ancient allegory of Saint Denis, the first bishop of Paris. In the third century, he was beheaded by Romans. And according to legend, he then picked up his head and walked several miles while sermonizing on repentance. Saint Denis is the very portrait of a martyr. A martyr. His cephala four, a statue of him headless but holding it, appears with other saints on the facade of Notre Dame. France is a secular nation, but I would wager that most every French child of Paris knows well the myth of Saint Denis. The concept of universalism, a common Frenchness. In stone, we see that embodied in the Pantheon and in the stone mausoleums within it. Voltaire, Hugo, and recently Josephine Baker. To rest there is to represent the finest of la patrie, the homeland. Ironically, the Pantheon is a temple of secularity in a former church dedicated to Saint Geneviève, patroness saint of Paris, whose prayers saved the city from the invading Huns. The narrative, the primary goals of liberté, égalité, fraternité are achieved through the surrender of separate identity. Now this holds true today. France rejects multiculturalism, a notion we celebrate here in America. The government forbids the collection of statistics of French society by religion, ethnicity, or identity. All are one, and that one is French.
This universalism is being passionately challenged today by those seeking to express religious beliefs, Muslims, Jews, Catholics, many question, will the center hold? The concept of laicite, the separation of church and state, in stone reveals itself in the, the slogan, liberté, égalité, fraternité, imprinted on all government buildings and schools, a constant reminder of the secular values of the revolution. The narrative, while secularity defines the state, the country remains overwhelmingly Catholic, if underwhelmingly observant. Well, this dichotomy was on display when the fire damaged Notre Dame in 2019. Vigils were emotional, but many Parisians bent over backwards. Macron, the prime example, to contextualize the love of Notre Dame and the need for its rapid restoration in terms of national values and not religious ones. Notre Dame as a religious beacon was more evident internationally where appeals to give money for its restoration were steeped in faith and religiosity. That battle is ongoing. Paris as artistic muse. In stone, we see plaques at Hemingway's apartment, the wall of Rambeau, literature imprinted on Paris literally the narrative, just being in Paris, is being an artist. You know, Gene Kelly offers a glib but great definition of Paris's inspiration in the 1951 Hollywood classic, An American in Paris. He plays a painter living the bohemian life in post-war Paris and says, brother, if you can't paint in Paris, you better give up and marry the boss's daughter. Meaning, make a few brushstrokes, stroll along the Seine, browse the bouquinists, and you are an artiste. Finally, the idea of l'amour a city of lovers. In stone, this is embodied in the tomb of Abelard and Elo Eloise, and with a plaque on the home where they lived and illicitly loved. The narrative, La Vie de l'Amour. Verona has its Romeo and Juliet, Paris has its Abelard and Eloise. Their ill-fated love of the 12th century has inspired and attracted lovers and honeymooners ever since. Abelard was a renowned theologian who felt a temptation and impregnated and then secretly married his student, Eloise, herself a prodigy in theology. When their illicit love was discovered, Eloise was banished to a nunnery. Abelard suffered worse. He was taken captive by thugs hired by Eloise's uncle and castrated. He became a monk. Abelard and Eloise never saw one another again, but their love letters, sometimes scholarly, other times erotic, bore witness to their undying love and its complicated place between innocence and sin. In death, Abelard and Eloise were reunited in a common tomb in Père Lachaise Cemetery, or re-entombed, that is. Père Lachaise opened in 1804 as a new concept, an Elysian field on the city's perim perimeter where loved ones would pay respects and gain respite. The cemetery was not initially a success. Parisians were accustomed to the convenience of nearby churchyard cemeteries. The city launched a kind of celebrity marketing campaign. The remains of Abelard and Eloise were relocated to the new Père Lachaise, along with the remains of a number of other notables, Moliere and La Fontaine. Well, the campaign worked, and the cemetery now has 1.3 million permanent residents, including inspirations to romance like Edith Piaf and Colette that draw young lovers and old romantics alike. Today, Eloise is studied as an early feminist and a literary influence who defined the concept of courtly love and expressed progressive views on marriage and the role of women. This brings us back to where we began, the culture wars and the Eiffel Tower and Sacre Coeur, and the ecosystems of ideas they embody as they were constructed amid political unrest and a culture war. Let's set the stage. Paris, 1870 to 1900. France was swirling in a maelstrom of ideas, many in conflict, that would eventually deliver a modern city into the 20th century. The period began with reconstructing a city and reconstituting a republic. And over three decades, Paris rebuilt and grew. It was a boom area for developers and real estate speculators. During this time, Paris showcased itself in a series of world's fairs as a pinnacle of science and style. Now, the great romantic novelists of the century, Balzac, Dumas, Flaubert, Sand, had either passed away or were at their career ends at this point, though Victor Hugo remained active and was a political force. Taking their place were Zola, de Maupassant, the poets Verlaine and Mallarmé. The art saw the excitement of Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Art Nouveau, and there were advances in photography and the emergence of cinema. All this played out on the wide new boulevards of the city, illuminated by gaslights. 
The cafe was dazzling, writes Baudelaire, in the eyes of the poor, even the gas burned with the ardor of a debut. Walter Benjamin labeled Paris the capital of the 19th century, and in the gaiety of the Belle Epoque, it proudly wore that feather in its bonnet. Construction of both the Eiffel Tower and Sacre Coeur began at this dynamic time when France's population had been depleted by war and its dignity shaken by an unexpected military defeat by the Prussians who then encircled Paris and held it captive. The Franco-Prussian War ended the Second Empire in 1870 and a transitional period of unrest followed. The rule of the Third Republic centered in Versailles, the counter rise of the Paris Commune, then its brutal suppression. Also, extreme nationalism was growing. It called for revanchism to claw back land lost to Prussia. Leading the charge was General Georges Boulanger, a, popular demo, a populist demagogue who questioned the validity of the presidential election, proposed altering the constitution, threatened to stage a coup d'etat and bring back an emperor or a monarchy, hmm. until he was threatened with arrest and prosecution. Hmm, history does repeat. This time also saw a polarizing culture war between secular and religious factions. Public education was wrested away from the church and made free, mandatory and secular under the Jules Ferry laws. Amid all this, the Eiffel Tower was held up as a temple of science and a symbol of reason and the secular state. The same era saw a resurgence of religious observance. Clericalists rallied around the cry that France needed to do penance for the moral decay of the second empire and the unspeakable sins of the godless Paris Commune. Sacre Coeur would become a symbol for that. In 1884, the French government called for proposals to construct La Tour de Fer des 300 mètres, an iron tower that would rise 300 meters, roughly a thousand feet. It would mark the centennial of the French Revolution and be inaugurated at the 1889 Exposition Universe uh, or uh, World Fair. The French Revolution was itself a class of ideas about monarch, absolutism, the seigneurial class system of the Ancien Regime versus the empowerment of le citoyen under the principles of liberté, égalité, fraternité. Well, notably, the revolution also abolished Catholicism as state religion. For a decade beginning in 1793, Notre Dame Cathedral was emptied of worshipers and renamed the Temple of Reason. The Eiffel Tower was seen as a marvel of technology and modernity and a continuation of the revolutionary values of reason and science. And it was to be constructed on the Champ de Mars, the site of two key revolutionary events. The first was the 1790 Fête de la Fédération, a celebration of the revolution and a new constitutional monarch in which Louis XVI, now King of the French and no longer King of France, swore to uphold the constitution. The second event came a year later after Louis XVI had unsuccessfully tried to flee Paris with his family. They were captured when the king stopped at an inn to sample their house specialty, pig's knuckles, one of his favorites. Well, despite the king's aborted flight, the assembly voted to retain him on his throne and a crowd of Republicans gathered to protest and were massacred by National Guard troops. Notably, General Lafayette was prominent at both events. He led the swearing of the oath of the, to the constitution, the constitution at the Fete then a year later led the charge that left 50 Parisians dead. The, the Champ de Mars is today a popular park and Parisians argue over its best use. The city plans to construct a visitor site there in preparation for the 2024 Olympics. Initially, the plan called for cutting down 200 year old trees to make room for bathrooms and an information kiosk. Tree advocates protested. One activist perched in the branches for more than a week. A compromise was, struck not to re, uh, compromise was struck not to remove the heritage trees, which play a vital role in sequestering carbon, something the iron, iron Tower does not do. A dispute continues. Tree advocates say that any digging will, dis, will disturb roots and ultimately doom these grand dames of the urban forest. Paris is an ecosystem idea of ideology and tree roots. 700 design firms sent proposals to build the tower. Some ignored the iron requirement and proposed building in wood, stone, and brick. One proposal made a literal reference to the revolution, a replica of a guillotine a thousand feet high. The winning design was submitted by Compagnie des Establishments Eiffel. The tower came to be known for uh, just Gustave Eiffel, but from the start, it was a collaboration by his team. 
The Eiffel Tower also premiered a series of new ideas of design, stress management, wind forces, and assemblage. The tower would acquire more than 18,000 parts, 7,300 tons of steel, two and a half million rivets, that together would enable iron beams to soar 300 meters into the sky, twice the height of any existing building at the time. Cochlin, chief engineer, drew up the basic design, a great python with four lattice girders standing apart at the base, coming together at top, joined at intervals with metal trusses. He'd been trained in graphostatics, a method of visualizing and calculating the needs of support structures through geometric principles. It had been used in iron bridge construction to maximize strength and minimize weight. But at this height, wind forces also needed to be calculated. Cochlin calculated the cross operating powers of wind in what he called an optimization process that yielded a workable design. Some credit Maurice Cochlin as the true inventor of the tower. At its 50th anniversary in 1939, he offered a rare reflection. La Père de la Tour s'est Eiffel. The father of the towers, Gustave Eiffel, mais l'idée et le calculus, c'est moi. So he claimed the math. Stephen Sylvester was the architect brought in by Eiffel to add embellishments to a design uh, deemed too utilitarian. This includes decorative arches at the base, a glass pavilion on the first level, a cupola at the top. Sylvester gave the, power, the tower its iconic curvaceousness, its Parisianness, its ooh la la. Well, getting something like this built is complicated, and the showman he fell had the vision, to drive the blusters and balls to make it all happen. In the process, he bought the rights to patent the design and cut out the others on his team. Construction lasted two years and involved process innovations, most of it pre assembled, the streamlined construction on site, and the tower rose with astonishing vitesse. Um, as for its uh, signature curvaceous design, it wasn't just style, it was part of the calculation to accommodate high altitude winds. Those curves have made the Eiffel Tower, La Dame de Fer, memorable. The eventual model for the world's leading paperweight and tourist tchotchke. Well, from the start, the Eiffel Tower was derided as an ugly, brutish assault on the graceful Parisian landscape. It was called Eiffel's monstrosity, the ogre of modernity. Words one hears today from urban dwellers who protest seeing their colorful boho neighborhood about to become boringly gentrified. A classic case of urbanism. Who wields the power of change? Who determines what a city looks like? How it functions? How we live in it? Architects attacked the tower. They disparaged Eiffel as a bridge builder, not an architect. Notable Parisians attacked the rising tower. Verlaine called it a belfry skeleton. Heisman called it a whole riddled suppository. French nationalists saw the Eiffel Tower as too American. Conspiracists accuse Eiffel of altering the weather, increasing thunderstorms and lightning strikes. Anti-Semites who see Jewish threats, even in the absence of Jews, called it part of a Jewish conspiracy by the German Jew Eiffel as an engineer, the Jew Alphonse, neither of whom was Jewish. As for the press, they made an industry out of disparaging the tower. The magazine Illustration called it a lighthouse, a nail, a chandelier and a symbol of industrial civilization. Le Matin published an alarmist headline, the tower is sinking, fake news. Several lawsuits were filed against Eiffel by adjacent property owners who feared a catastrophic collapse, iron beams raining down upon them, and Eiffel soldiered on. Then came the letter. Les artistes contre la tour Eiffel. 47 writers and artists signed a letter of protest to Adolphe Alphand, Minister of Works and Commissioner of the Exposition. It was published in Le Temps on February 14th, 1887. That's Valentine's Day, but it was hardly a love letter. We come, writers, painters, sculptors, architects, lovers enamored with the until now intact beauty of Paris to protest with all our forces, with all our indignation, in the name of neglected French taste, in the name of French art and French history, which is being threatened against the erection in the heart of our capital of the useless and monstrous Eiffel Tower. Hear the language here, l'inutile et monstrueuse tour Eiffel. Paris draws wonder and admiration, they continue. Will we let all this be desecrated? The city of Paris, will it any longer associate itself with the crazy ideas, with the mercenary imaginations of a machine builder to make itself irreparably ugly and to become dishonorous, uh, dishonorable? And for 20 years, we will see this spreading like an ink stain, this despicable shadow of a, the despicable column of bolted sheet metal to you who love Paris so much. 
We rely on you to plead Paris's cause, knowing that you will use all your energy, all the eloquence that must inspire an artist such as yourself to love what is beautiful, what is great, and what is just. L'amour de ce, ce qui est beau, de ce qui est grand, de ce qui est juste. Eiffel responded in an interview with Le Ton published uh, next to the artist writer. He chose his words carefully. Here's a few excerpts. Basically, the attack was quite excessive, whatever be the views of the protesters and the work aesthetic value. I will tell you all of my thoughts and hopes. As for me, I believe that the tower will have its own beauty because we are engineers. Do you therefore think the beauty does not concern us in our constructions and that at the same time, we make them solid and durable? We do not try hard to make them elegant? The tower will be the tallest structure ever raised by man. Will it not therefore be grandiose also in its own way? And why would what is admirable in Egypt become hideous and ridiculous in Paris? I've tried to understand that I cannot. Oh, but my project had two supporters that are still faithful to it. The patronage of men known for their great intelligence and the overwhelming force of public opinion. So why did leading writers, artists, and intellectuals of the day oppose the construction of the tower? Was it dislike for the new? Was it aesthetic revulsion? Was it to protest a dramatic change to a city without the people's say? Well, in any city, plans for a massive new structure prompts a common reaction, nimbyism, not in my backyard. You can hear the homeowners' voices at the zoning board appealing. Oh, it's out of line with the scale of our neighborhood and our community values. Belongs out in the 19th with the railroads and the factories. Well, in my view, the protest over the Eiffel Tower was not nimbyism, it was narrativeism. The presence of the tower, a curving mass of wrought iron, a thousand feet tall, ruptured the collective narrative of Paris in the minds of Parisians. It, called, it, it created what's called narrative dissonance. Garnier objected. The architect of the new opera house, itself called a Viennese convection, did the tower insult his uh, narrative that Paris should be draped in the opulence of Beaux-Arts, itself the descendants of neoclassicism and Baroque movements? Zola objected. In the belly of Paris, Zola describes the transformation of the nation of, of the neighborhood of Léal with the construction of Baltard's glass and iron pavilion. His main character, returning to his old neighborhood after years away, doesn't recognize where he is. His narrative is skewed by a changed landscape and by time. Is Zola, in protesting the Eiffel Tower, playing his own character? Verlaine objected. Did he fail to see the poetry in the tower, the graceful beauty and elegance of function that Eiffel claimed in his narrative? And then there's Baudelaire. The poet had died 20 years before the tower ran up, but you can almost hear his dissenting voice crying out from Les Fleurs de Mort. Le vieux Paris n'est plus. La fort d'une vie change plus vite, et là, que le cœur d'une mortel. The old Paris is no more. The shape of a city changes faster, alas, than the human heart. Roland Barthes is closely identified with semiotics, the study of signs and their meaning a movement that flourished in Paris in the late 20th century. In the Eiffel Tower and other mythologies, Bart depicts the tower as a paradoxical monument that embodies a series of narratives. There is the geometric paradox. The uh, tower is constructed of triangles that make up squares that form curves. Second, it's a monument, but an empty one. The Louvre you visit to see what's inside. The tower is empty. You see what's outside it. Everywhere in Paris, you see the tower. In the tower, you see Paris. Bart notes that the tower was built in the era of the bird's eye view. Panoramas of the city were popular attractions around the city and at world's fairs. Then came technology and ballooning, flying machines, photographer, photography. Nadar was a prime enthusiast and he took his camera aloft and captured astonishing images of the vast cityscape. Finally, the bird's eye view became available to anyone from atop the Eiffel Tower. Fittingly, the Eiffel Tower was inaugurated in a thoroughly secular ceremony. Workers were honored at a luncheon at the tower base, then a select group of dignitaries and press climbed the tower. Elevators were not yet installed and reaching the top took an hour. There, the tricolor French flag was unfurled with the initials RF, République Française. There were fireworks and La Marseillaise was sung. And there were speeches paying tribute to the design and technology collaboration team and to the workers who raised the tower. You will always remember the great efforts we have made in common to show everyone that, whether by its engineers or by its workers, France still holds a great place in the world and that we are always able to succeed where the others have failed and to that great honor of France and the Republic. 
Gustave Eiffel. Maurice Coughlin added, we salute the flag of 1789, which our fathers bore so proudly, which won so many victories, and which witnesses so much progress in science and humanity. We've tried to raise an adequate monument in honor of the great date of 1789, therefore the tower's colossal performance. And the crowd shouted, Gloire le Monsieur Eiffel et ses collaborateurs, vive la France, vive Paris, vive la République. There was no mention of God. The tower was at the time and for the next 40 years would be the tallest structure in the world. It was the pinnacle of modern science and technology and the progeny of the age of reason. Now history has no record of it, but perhaps from the top of the Eiffel Tower on that very day was the site of General Georges Boulanger, the ultra nationalist demagogue whose plans for a coup d'etat had collapsed, fleeing Paris never to return. As his, as his train pulled out of the station, it was an upward turning point for the Republic, for France, and for Paris. Boulanger's departing train might also have been visible across town in Montmartre. La Basilica de Sacre Coeur de Montmartre represented the very opposite of the Très Moderne Eiffel Tower. It was rendered in Romano-Byzantine Romano design and in dazzling white limestone. The Basilica embodied the hope of restoring Catholicism as state religion and, for some supporters, a return to monarchy. Well, that was the narrative. Crown and cross, reunited and empowered to save a nation been diminished by moral decay and misguided humanist values. Sacre Coeur had a long period of construction and many original supporters never lived to see it completed. It embodied a web of ideas, political and religious, aesthetic and mythic. The Basilica was proposed in 1870 by Felix Fournier, Bishop of Nantes, as penance for the moral decay of the now defunct Second Empire. Francis lost to Prussia, he said, was divine punishment for its sins. The Basilica would be called Sacre Coeur in dedication to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a mythical Catholic concept based on divine apparitions and Christ's boundless love and compassion for humanity. The Basilica site, Hill of the Martyrs, was chosen in 1872 by Joseph Hippolyte Huibert, Archbishop of Paris. He envisioned the Basilica as a lightning rod on the highest point of the city, a refuge for religious pilgrims. Now, at the time, the land was occupied, but Guibert petitioned the National Assembly to expropriate for the purpose of knitting together a broken France. The Assembly proclaimed the project uh, publicly useful for the expiation of the crimes which have crowned our sorrows. Critics screamed that this action was illegal. It conflated church and state, which had been separated by the revolution. It violated a foundational idea of French society and modern Paris. That was the compromise, and the first stone was laid in 1875. Supporters of the Sacre Coeur heralded the moment as the funeral of the principles of 1789. Their opponents fought construction every step of the way. It was the start of a bitter ideological uh, dispute that continues to today. Socialists attacked Sacre Coeur on ideological grounds. They bristled at the church's statement that the Basilica would provide France with needed penance for the Paris Commune, whose history they memorialized and whose martyrs have been executed on its very location. Penitence for what, wrote Emile Zola, for the revolution, for a century of free speech and science and emancipated reason. For that, they, they built a gigantic landmark that Paris can see from all its streets. The socialists proposed building a life-sized replica of the Statue of Liberty and placing it right in front of the Basilica to block any view of it. And to this day, secularists and, left, and leftists call for the removal of the Basilica. Sacre Coeur was also attacked on aesthetic grounds. It was a Turkish folly with odd cupolas more at home in Constantinople. Zola, Zola skewered it as a mausoleum, an evil force, an idolatrous temple built for the glorification of the absurd. But Sacre Coeur went up. It was inaugurated in 1891 and consecrated in 1918. It was designated a basilica, a church of special importance and heralded as a place that welcomes pilgrims from across uh, Christendom. Now you may think that this querelle between religionists and secularists is something of the past. Au contraire, in Paris, it's very much alive. In 2004, socialists scored a victory. Square Ouellette beneath the basilica was renamed Square Louise Michel for the anarchist who had been imprisoned and exiled for her role in the Paris Commune which itself was memorialized as the first rule of the proletariat under principles of Marxism, feminism, separation of church and state. 
Louise Michelle has been rediscovered as a trailblazing feminist and a founder of Anarcho, Anarcha Feminism. Then in 2017, former Prime Minister Lionel Jospin expressed his wish that Sacre Coeur be demolished. It was a symbol, he said, of obscurantism, bad taste, and the reactionary. In 2020, a campaign was launched to make Sacre Coeur a historic monument. This was vehemently opposed by the French Communist Party. They called it an affront to the memory of 32,000 communards who were murdered in the suppression of the commune. It was rewriting history, burying the revolution. And this came, ironically, at the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune. The Paris City Council granted historic designation in late 2022. Perhaps as an appeasement square, Louise Michel was included in the designation. One council member called it a bloodstain on a republic and on this unique revolution, which is the Paris Commune. The Catholic Church, which is seeking beatification for five priests executed by the commoners 150 years ago, called for moving forward and recognizing that the site is emblematic. Well, there may be common agreement on that. Both the Eiffel Tower and Sacre Coeur are emblematic, but for different reasons, uh, differing factions and opposing ideologies. Once again, ideas are never forgotten and seldom resolved in Paris, a city of ideas. Thank you for taking part today and thanks to the Alliance Francaise for providing the opportunity. Uh, and now we'll pass it on to Renee for some Q&A possibly. Roger, thank you so much for this extraordinary narrative of the city of Paris. And I think I think that we're all going to, and I'll make it clear to everyone, this will be available to all of us on YouTube um, in the next couple of days. So we can all watch more carefully and in more detail the incredibly, uh, the astounding, you know, intellectual, historical, romantic, secular, revolutionary Paris that I think many of us love. So we're very, very grateful to you. And I think we're going to all explore it more thoroughly thoroughly on YouTube and we have time to absorb it. I think we have a couple of questions um, in the chat. Well, the first question is, can we receive a video recording of the presentation? Yes, you will all be sent a video recording. And here's a good, I don't know if you have time to answer this, Roger. Yes. Next question is, how does the national motto or the phrase liberty, equality, and fraternity equate with anti-Semitism and other forms of racism and extremism in France? It's kind of a big question. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good one. <laughs> we'll do another hour. Yeah, that's, uh, well, the short answer is that those principles are remarkably uh, similar but different from what we hold dear here in the United States. Liberté, we understand. Fraternité is a different kind of a thing. And this leads to the idea of universalism, that fraternité means a equality and sameness between people that is not compromised by a call to different ethnicities and beliefs and division uh, between society. And that is the fundamental difference that a lot of religious groups struggle with. And there has been a lot of strife among Orthodox Jews in uh, in Paris, many of uh, them having moved to Israel or left because of their perception that their uh, ability to practice their religion is compromised. Same with very religious Muslims uh, and the head coverings that are common among um, uh, uh, Muslim women, um, uh, the wearing of large crosses as well is something that is not permitted in a public sphere uh, such as school. You can be different. You can have your own beliefs. That's something that France was one of the first to recognize going back even to the Edict of Nantes uh, in uh, 1599, if I have that right. Um, and so there's a long history of equality among different groups, uh, but um, the sameness of, of Frenchness is something that is uniquely part of the country and part of the mindset. So that's, a, that's something that I think a lot of Americans uh, struggle to, to understand, but that's kind of the short answer um, to uh, the anti-Semitism that we've seen there is just terrible. Um, and it's uh, very concerning um, as is a lot of uh, intolerance um, uh, throughout the world. So I don't mean to make, uh, to skirt the issue of that, but um, that would be my, my initial uh, response on that. Liberté, eternity. Uh, liberté, egalité, liberté, fraternité is, is the issue. 
So maybe we go back to to Robbie Wyman who who, who asked that question and she has to see if she has any response to that. Melissa, do you see any other questions from our audience? Uh, there's one new one that just popped up in the chat. Oh, here we go. Um, from Karen to everyone, what are your comments on the unpopular pension reform extending the work you're extending the, the you know your, your the work two two more years, which was in the New York Times today. I just got back from Paris. It was everywhere in the press. So 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 be very interesting to hear your comments based on the historical perspective that you have and the narrative that you have you know you understand so well uh, based on the French. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that is something we were talking about offline, as it uh, it was just in the, quite a quite a discussion of that in the New York Times today. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, I'm not sure how it stands right now, but President Macron has proposed uh, lowering. I'm sorry, raising the, the retirement age from 60 to 62 and uh, essentially requiring people to work longer to be able to um, to be able to support the what was called in the Times today a generous pension system that exists. Now, that's problematic there as well as here uh, in that people have worked all their lives with a certain expectation and uh, it's very difficult uh, to change expectations the way somebody would live. Um, the issues that were expressed in the Times today had to do with whether or not someone really could reasonably continue to work in their 50s and early 60s and so forth, or whether ageism plays uh, quite a role, a uh, substantial role, ageism, uh, gender inequality, in the issues of actually remaining in the workplace during that time. So um, I can't uh, draw a, uh, a position on that exactly. The uh, economics of it are obviously uh, the driver of this. It's not some sort of an ideological issue that people should work longer. Uh, the whole trend is, is toward more uh, leisure time and quality time. But um, I, I, you know, I, I think that Macron is, is uh, is motivated by by economics, and that's part of his uh, that's part of his identity. That he's a fiscally responsible person. Not saying that that's my something I agree with, but uh, keep watching this because this is going to be a major one. Yeah, well, I think was was it sixty to sixty two or sixty two to sixty four? No, sixty two to sixty four. Yeah, mm. That's what I thought. Mm. I, I, I saw correct. Isabel's mm. face, and I remember reading the article. You know, Roger, we're we're this, this has been so extraordinary. We're we're running out of time. Um, so I, I, if, unless there's, there's one other question, um, um, I think we need to say it and grand merci to you and to this incredible research that you've done. And again, as I said, I think we're all going to be on YouTube rewatching the incredible narrative that, that you have shared with the Alliance Francaise Network on Paris, a city of ideas. So I think we, we send our thanks to you. I think if everyone would go off mute and give you a great round of applause, um, we've really had such a good time and we've learned so much. I think I knew more about the Eiffel Tower, learned more today than I ever knew before. So thank you, Roger. Um, we'll be in touch and thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.